All right, we're live, I believe. All right, so welcome everybody to uh, round two, episode 1A of uh, Unlock Your Culture webcast. We kind of tried to do this last week in what we'll call a pilot and had some, we're on the unfortunate end of uh, some hacking by some uh, not so nice people with some imagery that uh, didn't really support our values. So uh, we kind of had to scrap uh, the recording part, but we did have an awesome conversation and I hate that a lot of people were waiting on the recording or got booted because we were trying to keep the security up. So uh, we're going to try to split this a little bit. We're going to talk culture for a little while here in the beginning. And then we're going to get into uh, the purpose of this episode, which is the normalization of deviance with uh, John Dixon, our good friend. Um, lots of good stuff that'll come out of that. So um, just a quick little background about the, the webcast for people I don't know. So uh, a few of us got together and we put on the Unlock Your uh, Culture online conference a couple months back. And we did a, a bunch of really good people over a, a, quite a few days there. And we just tried to get somebody on every topic that we thought went into, you know, fire department cultures. And so uh, we got really good feedback from it. It was a lot of good material, a lot of good training. And so uh, a few of us got together afterwards and said, hey, you know, that's a really cool concept. Um, we should kind of do a podcasty thing about it. But, you know, in the, the Zoom world now, we said, well, let's just make it a webcast. So let's get on here once a month and we'll pick a topic and we'll, we'll pick a guest if we can get some. And uh, we'll kind of have uh, ourselves, our four panelists, and in, uh, in, in a guest, and we'll just kind of talk about some stuff. And hopefully we'll get some people that are uh, really into firefighting to, to sign on with us and have a roundtable, right? So our goal for this is not for it to be a lecture or just us talking back and forth. It's to have a topic for us to throw some material out there. And then uh, for everybody that's watching live to get involved and throw their feedback to us. So by all means, you know, um, feel free to, to chime in and stuff uh, when we get to that point. Uh, we're going to try to use the raise hand thing, I guess, in the chat because um, we got a little <laughs> overzealous last time. And I think some people kind of got cut off. You know, they got lengthy and stuff like that. So um, so that's kind of the synopsis of it for everybody just to kind of know what's going on with it. So, um, so hopefully everybody can see my slide, right, Sean? It's up. Yeah, it's up. Okay. All right. So, um, so I just want to talk culture real quick. Um, and so for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Mark alone. I do the fire inside uh, on Facebook and uh, Instagram and the internet and all that good stuff. Uh, I do a little teaching at some of the conferences, um, a company officer on an engine company. So myself, uh, we've got Sean Duffy, who's uh, from build your culture uh, also on Facebook and Instagram and all the other uh, interwebs. Right. Uh, we have John Haywick. He's with, uh, John, type in here, see if he unmute himself. I'm all good. So yeah, it's you, uh, on the basics fire training. So hey, I'm up hey, here in Northern Jersey. And you might also hear that uh, that Jersey voice on the uh, Thin Red Line podcast as well, which is the other place you can find John among his many ventures. Um, and, and, uh, I, I think Sean's in here tonight too. So uh, yep, Sean, sure, go ahead, man. Sort of, we're sort of bugging. No, it's Sean Egan from. Oh, uh, Egan's in here. Okay, <laughs> Egan's in here too from uh, the other Sean. The other, right. the other Sean, exactly. So, all right, but, uh, Duffy, I'm proud to be part of this. And Duffy, give your background, bro. All right. So, uh, like Mark said, Sean Duffy, uh, I started uh, Build Your Culture with my good friend Pablo Jenner about a year and a half ago. Um, same thing, you know. We just came across a bunch of things that were frustrating us in the fire service, and decided, um, you know, we were kind of our own worst enemies. It doesn't do anybody any good if all you do is talk about it. Uh, so we wanted to actually do something about it. That's where Build Your Culture came in and uh, just encompasses pretty much whether whatever your your complaint is at that point, whether it's training or fire service Wait. culture, whatever it may be. Um, it, it's just a motivational thing for all of us to get together and, and try and change this thing. You know, we're, we're stronger together. Not one person can do this thing alone. Um, so We've created these things, and, and along the way, we've realized that it's also valuable to have everybody else's input because the, the more we dig into it, we realize that we're not alone, right? These are, these are common occurrences that are happening all over the country um, and all throughout the fire service. So we want to give an opportunity for everybody else to put their vision and uh, views on things into perspectives as well. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy that. 
you'll enjoy what we have coming up. And then uh, I'm going to turn it up. Unfortunately, Pablo is not with us tonight. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give it to uh, John Dixon over there, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Thank you, brother. Well, my name is John Dixon. I am a newly minted battalion chief of training and safety in the Teaneck, New Jersey Fire Department here up in, uh, in northern New Jersey. And for all of you who are not in the New York, New Jersey area, we don't talk funny. You all listen funny. So I just want to put that out there. All right. So <laughs> I've been in a fire service for about 23 years. I've worn both hats, uh, volunteer career, all ranks. I'm on, uh, on the volunteer side, moving up my way up in the career side. Uh, I've been out there on, on, on a conference, uh, national, regional, international, that kind of stuff. But uh, I really do enjoy meeting everybody and, and talking shop with everybody. And, and culture is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I don't, I mean, I have a Facebook page. I really don't run it. I don't have uh, a business, if you will. You know, I'm just, uh, just out there just spewing some of my rantings. But uh, I'm happy to be here with you all, and, and thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to a great discussion tonight. Good Thanks deal. for being here, John. All right, so I'm just going to get things going here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Duffy, and he's going to kind of elaborate on, on the very basics of what we're talking about. So um, what we talked about last time with culture, and it really got deep down into some rabbit holes about, you know, how we impacted and, you know, who's responsible for culture in the fire department. and you know, the fact that the rank and file have a much bigger role in, in how our fire departments operate and morale than I think a lot of people really factor in. You know, a lot of time we point at the fire chief or the battalion chief or the deputy chief or the training division, right? And they're not doing this, they're not doing that. So um, I, I really hate that we lost that conversation because it was so good about, you know, basically boiling it down to the individual level and the accountability level. So uh, we just wanted to brush on it real quick here in the beginning. And, you know, um, there's a lot of stuff out there about culture right now. It's kind of a hot topic in the fire service. And a lot of people don't necessarily understand it, I don't think. Uh, you know, it's not following my Facebook page or somebody else's. You know, it's not having a sticker on your helmet or, you know, the station pride stuff, right? That's all part of culture, but that's the superficial part, right? That's the part that comes later after you have a good thing going. So um, I start with words a lot of time in my classes. So um, I had this slide up here for a reason. So I, let, I just want to define culture, right? Let's, let's talk about what it means and not only what it means, you know, in the dictionary, but what does it mean in the fire service? So if you look at that picture right there, I kind of have two definitions highlighted, right? And there's a reason. So um, initially, before we did the Unlock Your Culture conference, I, would, I went by this definition, the second one there, which is a, a set of shared uh, attitudes, values, goals, practices that characterize an institutional organization. And I feel like everybody here would probably agree that that pretty much hits on culture in the fire service, right? Like it, it covers everything. It's our attitudes, right? And, and we're an organization. Uh, but as I did my research, I, I stumbled upon this last definition here. And I, and I feel like this fits us so much better as an occupation, right? So the, the integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior that depends upon the capacity for learning and transmitting knowledge to succeeding generations. And to me, it's so much better because what are we always talking about in the fire service, right? The senior guy passing things down, traditions, customs, all that stuff, right? And then when we find that people say, well, our culture sucks or, you know, we can't, you know, form a culture. You have the other side where, you know, we have an awesome culture. But what are we normally talking about here, right? We're, we're talking about that ability to learn, that ability to move on, that ability to evolve, which is a big word I like to use in, instead of change because change is that big, scary word where, Nobody wants to change, right? Because that means we're doing something wrong. Where if we talk about evolving, it's, you know, taking what we do well and making it better. So um, that's just where I like to start. I just like to drop that in your head. So you're kind of stewing about it as we, we talk about culture a little bit and really think about your department, and your organization. And, you know, are you good at that? Do you even have a pattern of knowledge and beliefs? Or is it a bunch of individuals running around kind of doing their own thing? You know, um, are you transmitting that knowledge to the next generation? Or, you know, if you are, what, what information is getting transmitted? Because sometimes with the cultures, what we see is we see the wrong information. And I say raw, meaning non-productive, toxic, you know, things that don't help us. So, you know, really keep that in the back of your mind as you go back to your departments and hopefully with what we learned tonight, you know, from uh, Chief Dixon and, and kind of how you're going to play that out. So I'm going to go to this next picture here and I'm going to uh, send it over to Sean. So 
we see that culture can't be defined or measured, right? Everything that's highlighted there is, is in my personal opinion, um, the exact things that we need to be focused on, right? So we talk about organizations. Everybody has an idea of what the best organization would be or how often do we hear it? Well, that department over there is great. And if we could just be like them, then everything would be okay. We got to understand that when it comes to culture and the change or enhancement or anything else like that, it's the individual's responsibility just as much as it is the leadership's responsibility, right? So we can have the best policy, the best standards and everything we want, but culture is going to eat strategy for breakfast. And what I mean by that is if you put into a great strategy of how you're going to win or how you're going to create this awesome team or, or a department that everybody wants to work for, if you don't have the people that rally behind that with the right mindset, it's never going to go anywhere, right? So it's really defined by our, by our habits. And John's going to touch on that as we move on and, and how habits affect us, right? Um, really, there has to be a standard and everybody has to meet that standard and then constantly try to um, move past that standard, right? We want to elevate that because when we don't and we find ourselves on a rut, that's when we start thinking. And although that plateaus are normal, you know, we've got to push through those. We really got to let our team dynamics come into play and stay focused on the mission of, hey, we got two options, right? I can let what's going on define me and, and my worth ethic and habits and all that, which in turn is going to just create this culture of us versus them. Or I could take what's happening, I could process it, formulate a plan, put that plan into action, and continuously work on achieving that end goal. Um, so that's where our performance standards and our objectives come into play. Uh, you know, Regardless of who's in charge, we all own a piece of that pie. And we have to be proud of that. And we have to make sure that when we're coming in, that every effort and everything we do is to better it, right? We don't want to be stagnant or anything else because then we're just not doing anything. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and let either of the Johns go ahead and touch on that if they wish to. And uh, we'll move on to the next topic. So I'm just arriving at work. I got called in for overtime. Like always, uh, it's always the case. I've got something scheduled and uh, something happens. I get called in, but it's nice. We don't get overtime all that much. So uh, I'm just in a parking lot down the street from the station. So I'm, I'm really like I like to be. Uh, and I guess that's part of the culture um, that I can talk about for, my, for myself, but it's a culture we start out when we first get into the fire service. And it's started by the senior firefighters maybe sometimes the officers, but a lot of times it's the senior guys that puts the, puts the onus on the junior firefighters and, tell, and explaining to them the importance of certain things. I was told, make sure you're never a minute man. Be there ahead of time. No, getting there early gives you a lot of different aspects to it, to, to the job. If you're able to have coffee with the off-going shift, find out what happened. How's your apparatus? What kind of calls did they have? all different things that are going to be good habits to create. And culture is, can be, for me, uh, it's part of a habit. And knowing that culture and how you set your habits up for success, it's one of the things we need to do in the fire service as, as senior firefighters for our junior firefighters and as uh, officers of all ranks. Uh, I say the lieutenant in the captain position has the most influence on the rank and file more than chiefs and chief, uh, chief officers, just for the fact that we're down in the trenches with, with the firefighters every day on, on the shifts, on the rigs, in the firehouse, right? They say what, 85% is downtime, that 50, other 15% is actually responses. That 85% is so important of what you do as a senior firefighter and as a, an officer, especially a lieutenant and captain, on your how you set forth what you want for success for your department. You have such a big influence. You can either sit back and do nothing or you can make the change for better. And I think, John, I think John's going to uh, talk about normalization and how things can you know, 
we feel it's the right thing to do and it might be the wrong thing, but we've been doing it so long that we feel it's right. So uh, I don't want to take any thunder away from uh, my brother. Dixon, kick Dobby. it off. First off, <laughs> first off, I want to apologize for my mouthy dog that's upstairs. So if you hear my dog, I apologize. But uh, I took a couple of notes while the three of you were talking. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to bring up when you're talking about performance standards is indoctrination versus the fire service perspective. If you think about in the volunteer side, <clears throat> there's volunteers that start in the Explorer program or the junior firefighter program at the age of as early as 14. In the career side, I believe you have to be at least 18. I think that's pretty much of a, a national, national benchmark that everybody has to be at least 18 for the career side. <clears throat> Do you realize that your culture is set your human beliefs and your perspective is set by the time you're 12 to 13 years old. So think about this. We are, we are in docking newer firefighters. They already have a set standard of performance perspective in their brains. And we are trying to indoctrinate them into the fire service. And you hear the, the salty old dog firefighters. And, and I don't, I mean that with all due respect, Ah, these, these damn millennials, they don't understand our culture. They don't understand what it is that we're supposed to do. They understand. I mean, we can get into the conversation of, you know, did you try to have the conversation and emotional intelligence versus, you know, intelligence uh, quotient and stuff like that. But they already have their perspective. And you can see that playing outside of the fire service. You can, you can talk about politics. You can talk about popular culture. That's why there's such a divide. Right, because people have already made up their minds, and then we are trying to fit them into a mold. Most of the time, the people who are, or I should say, the firefighters who are uh, adamant or or very passionate about their culture, have been in the fire service for quite some time, and they have this rub with the newer generation of firefighters because they are not conforming. So I ask you this: Does your organizations and your departments have an indoctrination process? Now, I see Brother Mark Davidson, a, four, a fellow Marine, is, uh, is in the Zoom session. And uh, him and I, we could talk all day about indoctrination, uh, especially on the, on the good old island of Paris Island, South Carolina. We, we were taught everything, how to walk, how to talk, how to dress, everything. Think about if we had that opportunity in the fire service, right? And I, obviously, we don't have to get so you know, deep down in, in the details of dressing uh, our recruits, but think about this. Do you, do you teach your recruits or do you teach your newer firefighters how to wear their dress uniform properly? Or how about this one? When was the last time you see, uh, you know, a newspaper article of, uh, you know, at a funeral or a promotional ceremony and you see people and firefighters saluting like they're in a French foreign legion. They don't understand even how to salute. They even use their left hand sometimes, right? Did you take the time? <laughs> did you take the time to teach that firefighter, that culture, our culture, not just a fire service culture, but the culture of respect. So one of the things we're talking about perspective is words, right? Words matter, language matters, and meaning matters. So when you say you want to change something, when someone says, hey, I want to change this, what's your initial reaction? Your blood pressure probably boils and you're like, I'm not changing anything. But if you say, hey, man, I want to take a look at this and I want to improve upon this. You're meaning the same thing. You're just using a different word. So when you find yourself saying, hey, we need to change this about our department, or we need to change this about so-and-so, look at it from, a, from the double positive. Hey, I'd like to improve upon what this person, excuse me, what this person is doing or what this organization is doing. Don't focus on a double negative, focus on the double positive and that's the win-win. So that's perspective. Uh, we talked about indoctrination. The fire service is undergoing identity crisis. I don't care whether you receive a paycheck or not. We are all professionals. And there are so many discussions of education versus experience. You can have 25 years of experience and have zero education in the fire service. So th that's an age old debate that we can really go down rabbit holes. We were talking about rabbit holes earlier. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pull back the curtain on that one. But individual perspective is what drives culture. And you, just like motivation, you can't forcefully motivate anybody. All you can do if you're a fire service leader, a senior man, or just a, a well-respected three to five-year firefighter is provide the environment 
for motivation, right? You can't push a rope. So you need to make sure that, that, that there's necessary resources, there's necessary want or desire for the culture to take place because you can't force that upon anybody. Just like what brother Mark said about the, the helmet stickers and the station prod and all that kind of stuff. That stuff is great. It's, it's all well, but if you don't have the very basics, right? We always talk about back to the basics. The basics of the human condition is what's going to drive culture. So I had a conversation with, with, a, with a, a fire chief down to the National Fire Academy. And uh, one of the topics of discussion was, can you fire a volunteer firefighter? And I said, sure you can. He goes, well, why? They're volunteers. So we got into this long drawn out thing. And it all came down to the, uh, the November, you know, you grow the mustaches for the, the no shave November for the cancer, right? So he had made a comment that he told all of his rookies and probies that they weren't allowed to grow mustaches. They haven't earned that respect yet to be one of the, one of the men, if you will. And I said, well, first off, that's, excuse my language, but that's a douche thing to say, especially when you're raising money for funds for cancer, right? And the next thing is right off the bat, you're telling a newer member of your organization that they can't be one of you. So I asked him, I said, chief, let me ask you a question. Does he wear a patch on his uniform? He or she wear a patch? Yeah, yeah, they wear a patch. What's it say? XYZ fire department. Okay, great. Did you give that person a badge? Yeah, yeah, what's it say? Oh, XYZ firefighter, you know? Okay, great. So you dress the person the way you want them to look. You told them how you want them to act, but now you're telling them that they can't be included with other organizational cultures, right? Uh, 10 year rookies flaunting their time. Oh, the two, the 220 syndrome, right? Of course, I'm just uh, responding to uh, Mr. Morgan. Yeah, the 220. Well, again, it all comes down to proper indoctrination. Has anybody ever sat down and told that person, hey man, you're acting like a fool, right? So I, I know I went off on a, a Mr. Duffy, I'm sorry, brother, to, uh, to no, go off no, on a no, tangent no. about indoctrination, but those are my thoughts. I took down a couple of those notes and uh, it, all, it, all, it all starts with the first perspective, their perspective, yeah. the incoming perspective. Actually, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, John, because there's something that, um, that we see a lot and it's, well, my department should give me everything, right? So when we ask people like, hey, why are you not doing these things? Why are you not training? Why are you not furthering your uh, education? Well, my department doesn't provide me with the ability to do that. Our, your fire department should not hold your hand, right? And it just, it drives me crazy when we see that because that's an excuse used why you don't want to put forth the work and effort to do something. But let there be a promotion coming up or let the, that person find out that there's a loophole and doing something or getting around doing something they don't want to do and watch how productive they become. Right. So really when we're coming in and you're talking about indoctrination, we need to be telling them that too. Your career is what you make it. This culture is what you make it. You know, if you, if you don't like something, figure out a way to change it or enhance it. Right. Um, a lot of people get really angry with the word change. Right. Because they feel like we're not, um, honoring what has come before us, but really it's about enhancement, right? When we say we're going to change something, we're implying it doesn't work, right? We've tried it. It doesn't work. We've got to change this. When we're saying enhancement, we say, Hey, it's gotten us this far. Okay. It's done well, but it needs to be better. And we move forward from that. So when we're indoctrinating these individuals coming in, we need to let them know all of that. Hey, you're just as much part of this team and the success of this agency as anybody else here. But you have to put in the time and the effort, and you have to want to see that through. And if you don't, it doesn't matter because it's never going to happen. Yeah, man. And this is a, this is a great segue. Mark, uh, Brother Mark alone, do you want to chime in before I get into the ABCs? Yeah, I took, uh, I took a couple notes on what you talked about, and I think it's going to go nicely into getting us kind of off of culture as a whole and getting it into the program. So – uh, the first one that you kind of touched on to me is that you, you talked about millennials and entitlement and stuff. And, you know, one of the things I talk about quite a bit is that if you really sit down and watch the people in the department, you know, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there are, there are young kids coming in the fire service that, you know, aren't entitled that haven't got trophies along with their life. And that's a whole, you know, different can of worms to deal with. But I think if we all took a very hard look at our departments, 
a lot of the most entitled people have probably been there the longest. And they think because they have been there and they have achieved a rank or a position or an assignment that they are better than everybody else. And these are the ones that will latch on to the young people and teach them that crap by, you know, serve me, serve me, serve me, especially the people in leadership positions, you know, and that's, that's a lot of where this culture thing goes down all those rabbit holes of what's right, what's wrong. Um, so on top of that, you know, I think another thing that feeds into that, when you talked about, you know, indoctrination and when people have already kind of adopted their culture, you know, age wise, is that uh, the fire service is not what it was two decades ago. People are not spending 35 years at the same fire department anymore. So not only are we battling somebody who has their own cultural norms and beliefs from just their social life and their upbringing and their family life, but now we have people that at 5, 10, 15, even 20 years into their career are going to a new department and they're bringing that culture with them, whether they know it or not, right? And it's clashing a lot of time with the culture they're entering. And then on top of that, look at the fire chief thing, right? Like a lot of fire chiefs, you know, at 30, 35 years, maybe less. They're going, and, and most fire chiefs are only staying places for five years or 10 years now. They're not staying for like they used to. So, again, you have these constant, you know, culture within culture conflicts, you know, because of these things. Um, and, and what that ties into me, where I think this is going to tie into to your, your program for tonight, is, is the motivation aspect, which is, you know, especially with new people, if you're trying to build a culture, right, like we all know you're, you're not going to change the person that's been there 20 years to a degree, right? You might, you know, ad adapt them a little bit, but you're not going to make big movements as far as their beliefs and their ideals. So if you're trying to motivate your newest members to steer that culture in a different direction, who are you putting them with, right? Don't put them with the entitled people, the whiny people, put them with people that have a motivation that can show them that motivation is a good thing instead of expecting them to be motivated. Because that's where a lot of people lack right now. And I think that ties into what you're going to talk about, right? What do we make normal in our departments that, and then we come back and we, we just can't figure out, well, I don't understand what happened, but what if we normalize that's not correct? All right. So getting into the normalization of deviance, uh, we're going to get into the ABCs, attitudes, behaviors, and conditions. And it's important because culture plays a huge role into complacency. And uh, one of the things why I love delivering this program in, in person is because we do have such a, a round table discussion at the conferences and whatnot. So it's a, little, uh, it's a little awkward doing it via Zoom because I can't really have a lot of interaction with you all. But attitudes, what attitude do you bring to the table? Uh, for instance, so I'm the training and safety officer of my department and we don't currently have a professional development model. And this is a shot at, at Chief Davidson. Uh, you know, you, he's doing great work down there with his professional development. I've been, I've been watching his Facebook page and whatnot, and, and you're, do, you're really doing some good work, brother. So I started a fire officer one and two program in my department. And my fire chief said, are you going to make it mandatory? What do you think I said? I said, absolutely not. Well, well why not? Does, don't you think this is important for everybody to know and understand? I said, sure is. He goes, well, then why won't you make it mandatory? I said, because I don't want anybody in the room that doesn't want to be there. He goes, well, what if you only have two people? I said, well, then those two people are going to get the best damn training they ever had. I don't, I don't care if it's one person, one-on-one, -on -one, even better. Smaller groups are better. We all know that, right? So he was kind of taken back. And I kind of told my fire chief, I said, look, culture is like a huge battleship with a very tiny rudder. You can't turn on a dime with culture. It takes planning right? It takes strategic vision planning in order to take any organization, not just a fire service, any organization from where it is to where it needs to be. And, and who makes that decision? Who's in charge of that attitude, right? The attitudes beget behaviors because if you have improper behaviors, chances are you have a poor attitude or a group of poor attitudes, Right. And it's, you know, it's the, it's the, the 20, 60, 20 analogy, right? The 20% of the department on the bottom of the department, you know, they have poor attitudes that, you know, they really don't want to improve themselves. They're just for the paycheck or they're just for the t-shirt or just there to say that, you know, that they're part of the organization and they pick it apart. Then you have the 60 to 60%, 60 the middle, the middle half of the department, more than half the middle section of the department where they can go either way. They're fence sitters. They can be instigated or they can be controlled by the bottom 20% or the, or the higher 20%. 
The top 20%, they're your go-getters. They're self-motivated. You don't need to motivate them. They've already found the attitudes and conditions to have those proper behaviors. But where do we as fire officers, fire chiefs, or even, even firefighters who are, I don't want to say crazy, they are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They are passionate. There we go. They're passionate, right? Because you got to watch what you say. They are passionate about attitudes. We spend a lot of our time with the bottom 20% of our departments trying to change them, trying to change their perspective. And I'm using that C word again, change. How do you get somebody to improve? Well, my, my goal as a training and safety officer for ABCs of complacency is to set a pattern again, have the resources and the environment to motivate them. This way they don't go towards the bottom of the barrel. They want to go towards the top of the barrel, right? Does that make sense? I don't see any, you know, a couple of nodding heads, right? So yeah, that's, a, that's, that's ABCs, attitudes, behaviors, and conditions. Your attitudes set your behaviors, your behaviors and your attitudes are driven by the conditions. If you are part of an organization that everybody thinks that the sky is falling and this sucks and we can't do everything right and so-and-so has done this and so-and-so has done that, well, then your attitude sucks, right? So how do you improve somebody's attitude? Well, you have to improve the conditions, right? So that's the ABCs and that's very driven by culture and it doesn't happen overnight. And most firefighters are type A personalities and we are impatient human beings. We want everything yesterday, right? Myself included. As a training and safety officer, I was like, I can't believe we're not doing X, Y, Z. Well, when I sat down and I planned it out, I'm like, this is going to take me about 18 months, if not 24 months, to institute a professional development model in my, in my organization. So you have to be in it for the long haul, if you will. And truth be told, most leaders will never see the fruits of their actions or the fruits of their labor, you know, for quite some time. Right. So the ABCs, um, we talked about indoctrination. I'm going to throw a question out there and I'm probably going against format brother, but, uh, brother Mark, but I, I'd like to throw a question out there. There is no format. It's your floor. <laughs> right. I'd like to, I'd like to throw a question out and I'll, and I'll wait for, I'll wait for a response. Has anybody been drafted into the fire service? No. Is there anybody in the room who does not know what a draft card is? And I'm really starting to show my age, oh. right? We were talking about age before, right? So no one's been drafted into the fire service. And this goes into the, into the conversation I had with the fire chief at the NFA. Yes, you can fire people. You can fire volunteers. You can fire careers. And I've told plenty of people, if you don't like the job, seek life elsewhere. It's okay to leave. No one is handcuffing you to your fire department. And I understand there's a lot of different conditions. It's easier said than done, especially if you are a career firefighter and, you're, and you get the, uh, the, mid, the mid-career grumpies, if you will, right? Everyone gets that seven-year itch, right? And you're like, oh man, this sucks. But think about this. Nobody is chaining you to the radiator to keep you in the fire service. The open door policy works both ways. As a fire chief, I have an open door policy. You want to come and complain? Great. Have a solution. But the door also swings the other way. When I have a problem and my solution is to get rid of you because you don't fit into the mission, vision, and values of the organization, then seek life elsewhere, right? So bringing it back to normalization and deviance. We as humans under time and pressure will most likely take a safety shortcut to meet a set standard of performance. So if you happen to see, uh, I'm just throwing a, a minor injury out there. Uh, hand injuries, right? That's like the number two or number three most, uh, most common non-life-threatening injuries is, is hand injuries. Why? Because we don't wear gloves. Why? Because we feel we don't have enough time to put them on or we're too task saturated. We have five other things that we're doing. We're stretching a line. We're giving a, the radio report. We're, we're, we're waving on incoming units, whatever it may be. And you get a hand injury because you're tightening a coupling. And, and this is a true story. I was tightening a coupling on an inch three quarter line in a dumpster fire. I had plenty of time wasn't wearing my gloves, right? Mr. NOD wasn't wearing his gloves. I became complacent. Why? Because to me, it wasn't a life-threatening situation. I had time and that time bit me in the ass, right? I ended up getting stitches all down my thumb because the pump operator charged the line due to poor communication between me as a company officer and my pump operator. I wasn't ready for it. I was tightening the couplings and it jumped in the, in the, uh, the, uh, 
the nub. <laughs> What's that called? The uh, Higby. The Higby notch. There you go. The Higby indicator. Sorry, it's been a while since I taught the academy. The Higby indicator scratched, it, it really gouged into my thumb. So that was a condition of my complacency, right? I should have came off the rig and, and, and brother Ryan Pennington, will, he'll, he'll chastise me every time, right? Wear are the gloves coming off the rig? Be able to mask up coming, you know, coming off the rig with your gloves on. But that is a form of, of complacency. Now, here's another question. Do you think people who are complacent, do you think they know or that they are aware that they're complacent? What do you think? How do you understand? Is complacency like carbon monoxide? You can't see, you can't taste it, you can't smell it. How do you know complacency is there? How do you know that you as an individual is complacent or an organization at large is complacent? Well, for organizations, statistics work, right? The, the NIFRS reports or the line of duty death reports or the near miss reports, those work, right? But as an individual, how do you know if you're drifting towards failure? I'm gonna talk about that. I did not coin that, that was Dr. Sidney Decker that coined the phrase drift into failure. And he's, wrote in a few, he's written a few bo uh, books on that. But how do you know? How do you know if you are complacent individually? What's a warning sign? Let me make sure, John, just real quick. Like, if you guys, are you guys able to unmute your microphones, like, to answer questions? Or do I have to ask you to unmute? Because if you can, just go ahead and, you know, feel free to chime in. We want it to be a discussion. Looks like people are, Mark. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure because sometimes it doesn't work that way. So, yeah, if he's got a question you got to answer, feel free to speak up. You know, we're all, we're all learning here as we go. Can anybody tell me how they feel that maybe they can be warned that the uh, complacency, that you're complacent? Who's got an idea? Anybody? Bueller. I'll throw it out. I think when you when you show up to things expecting certain conditions and things to happen and you find yourself frequently surprised by, well, I did A and B didn't happen, right? Well, I thought, I thought, I thought, but you thought wrong, right? So maybe your, your game plan doesn't seem to work. So picture this. Complacency is a traffic light, red, yellow, and green, right? And I have a graphic in my, in my presentation. So picture a traffic light all, if you will. All, all of us operate within the yellow zone, right? There are things that we all do that we don't think are complacent until it goes into the red zone when we get injured or, we, or you know, thankfully somebody doesn't end up, end up killed in a line of duty. Now, I often ask this question, who doesn't wear your seatbelts in the apparatus? And be honest, right? Some people would raise their hands. Some people wouldn't, right? We're all in video. So no one's going to want to raise their hand in video in a live room. It's a different story. <laughs> but think about this. If, if you don't wear your seatbelt in the apparatus, you probably have at least two to three excuses why you don't. Chances are you've never been in an apparatus uh, accident. If you have, what do you think you might be wearing? Chances are your seatbelt, right? So if you wear your seatbelt and you're personally in your POV and your, in your regular car, but you don't wear your seatbelt in the apparatus, what's changed? Your perspective has changed. You're in a bigger apparatus. If somebody hits you, it's really going to screw their day up, not your day up. Or I really need the extra 10 to 15 seconds to jump out of the cab and give my brief initial ready report and throw the ladder and stretch the line. Is 10 seconds is really going to impact your habit if you will, right? We're talking about developing positive habits in a couple of seconds. And if something is as significant as wearing a seatbelt, then you are complacent. You won't realize it until you get into an accident and you get jammed up. Now, how many times has somebody told you, hey, put your seatbelt on? Some, some good company officers do that. Some chauffeurs do that. Drivers, whatever you call them, operators, right? But think about that. You don't even realize you're not wearing your seatbelt until somebody tells you, hey, put your seatbelt on. So you are operating in the yellow zone. We, the absence of safety, you are assuming, the, I'm sorry, the absence of an error, you are assuming safety. Therefore, you're going to keep on doing it until you hit the red zone and when you get caught, caught in a jackpot. So developing positive habits. Right? Every morning I come to work, when I was a company officer, even when I'm riding a buggy now as a, as a, as a fill-in battalion, the first thing I do is check my SCBA. First thing I do. Not that I don't trust the person I'm relieving, I trust them with my life, just not my credit card. But think about, but think about this, right? Which brings me another thing about culture, right? You could leave a hundred dollar bill on the kitchen table and be there for a week, but you wouldn't trust somebody with your credit card for a day. Think about that as, you know, for culture, organizational culture. So I check my SCBA, why? Because 4,500 PSI is 4,500 PSI. 
right? That's why I check it. And I don't even think about it. It's muscle memory. Just like with uh, Brother Hayrick, he's probably off the call now, but he wanted to work early. He's not a minute man. He's developing a positive behavior, which is setting a positive condition of being well-informed, getting to pass on information from his previous company officer or, or his house captain or, or the battalion, what, what have you, right? So I'm trying to think of some other things. So we talked about hand injuries as CBAs, what are, the, what are there some habits? Obviously all of you on the, on, the, on the webinar today have developed positive habits. It's a Sunday evening and you're spending your time taking your skills and your education and you know, to the next level. And you might have already heard about normalization and deviance. You might, might not have, but now you're hearing it from a different perspective. And that's what we're talking about. Perspective drives the ABCs. Now I've got something to add if you don't mind. Please, by all means. So you were talking about SCBA bottles, 4,500, it's 4,500. Yes, I sir. want everybody to think about this for a second. How often do we deviate from what we're supposed to do, right? What I mean by that is we all know that a full cylinder is what we're supposed to carry, right? It's, it's got a gauge on it for a reason. We all want, hopefully, we all want all the air we can possibly get. But how many departments make policies that says, you don't have to change your air cylinder until it's 3,800 PSI. What did we just do? When we're check, checking out those trucks, or the, when we're doing our truck checks, we flip that thing over, uh, it's 4,200, we're good. We're good till it hits 38. We now forced our own members to follow a standard that is not beneficial to them because we told them that don't worry about that thing until it hits 3,800. So that's an exact am, uh, example of uh, normalization of deviance. hundred percent. And, and, and for those you know, sticking on the SCBA thing, do you know on, on a Scott cylinder, the indicators on the bottom of the valve, they're two separate valves, two separate indicators. One side can say 4,500, the other side can say 4,000. So when you're just taking a peek on the bottom of your, of your apparatus seat and you're looking, oh, it's in the yellow or oh, it's just a tick under, under 4,500 in the yellow, the other side can say 3,500. You won't know that until you actually take the SCBA out of the harness and look at it. Right? I learned that when I went to a, you know, a technician thing about all the moving parts of a cylinder and, and, and an air pack and whatnot. But uh, Chief of Laura, right? you, you, you're 100% correct about people still not wearing their hoods. I just had this on a car fire. Uh, the nozzle, it was my last shift as a company officer, by the way. And we had a, a car fire, you know, bread and butter car fire. The, the, one of my biggest pet peeves, and I'm sorry if I'm gonna offend anybody when I say this, if you let your SCBA waist straps dangle I'm going to tie them into a knot and tie you to the apparatus. That is one of my biggest pet peeves, man. I, I cannot. I'm, I'm guilty. I learned that bad uh, habit early on. I, I've struggled to fix it, but yeah, I, I'm uh, better about it, but I used to not ever. And so, right? and it's a Northern thing though, John, I learned that in the North. I'm just telling you. <laughs> it's it, the, the four magic letters, right? The four magic letters fired. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so it was a car fire uh, and uh, you know, Everybody had their cell phones up like this. It was on a street corner in the, in the afternoon, like three o'clock. Everyone's recording like this. Now here I am. I'm the department safety and, and training officer catching, a, catching an overtime shift as a company officer. And I have a nozzle, uh, uh, the nozzleman, no hood, and the SCBA is all jacked up. So I tap them on the shoulder, say, hey, bud, give me the nozzle. Go get yourself straight and come back to the line. So I put the fire out. If you can't put out a car fire with, you know, an inch and three quarter, 100, you know, uh, attack line by yourself then it's either pumped way too high or, or something something else is wrong but uh, long story short he came back we went back to the station to fill cylinders and he was pissed off at me why do you think he was pissed he was all oh, you just wanted the nozzle on your last you know last shift you know to put out the last fire i said really i should be pissed because i had to do your job <laughs> which means i couldn't do my job which was look out for you and look out for the civil look out for everybody right so that's that's enough harping on the scbas but uh, I'm, I'm going to throw one more while you're on a topic, especially with oh the car boy. fires. But well, I mean, how many videos do you watch where the SCBA is on, but it's not on? Right. We wear it on our back and we tote it around, but we don't breathe off of it. I, I can't think of anything anywhere more I'd want it than a car, but that's just me. So, so Dr. Decker, Dr. Sidney Decker talks about the drift into failure process. And if you think about what happened with the FAA, in the 70s and 80s with bringing on crew resource management, where if you see something, say something. It's kind of like the Port Authority of New Jersey and New York. If you see something, say something, right? 
That's what crew resource management is. So talking about attitudes, behaviors, and conditions, does your, we'll, we'll stay at the company level. Does your company allow the one-year firefighter to see a safety infraction actually say something about it? Of course, there's a time and a place to do it, right? If your company officer says, hey, go play in traffic, and go, okay, sir, I'll, I'll do it. Doesn't make sense, right? But if your company officer says, hey, man, grab the two and a half and meet me in the back. I got to go do my 360. You follow the order, right? That's, that's what we do. It's the autocratic leadership style. Far too many times, a lot of our complacency is born off of the fire ground. That's where we make a majority of our mistakes, again, because of improper indoctrination, improper attitudes, behaviors, and condition. So we are drifting towards failure. Every day, we are drifting towards some type of a systems failure or a personal failure. And when the question I asked before is, how do you know that you are complacent? Is you don't know until somebody tells you or you find yourself in a situation where you get injured. It's the chain of events. And what you're trying to do to defeat complacency is break that chain of events. And whatever that is, and I'm talking in generalities, only because every organization has contributing factors. It could be lack of staffing, lack of uh, uh, funding. It could be lack of equipment. It could be a lack of whatever. And the human condition is always to rationalize and cast blame onto what caused us pain or what caused a failure. That is the human condition. Our, our brains are pre-wired to do that. We always wanna look for somebody to blame. So knowing you're complacent, like I said, it's like carbon monoxide. You don't know it's there. We don't have a meter for complacency. So one of the biggest ways to defeat complacency is to develop an accountability network. And you know, I've, I talk about those often, an accountability network at work and accountability network outside of work. You need people that are of like minds to understand your mission, vision, and values. And this goes into your personal mission statement. If you don't have a personal mission statement, you're drifting towards failure. If you don't understand why it's important to have a personal mission statement, how do you know where you're going to want to be five years from now? What is your vision? How are you going to actually get there? Right? That's how you avoid complacency. Let being truthful and honest to yourself, performing a self-evaluation, and then letting other people know in an accountability network. And, and the accountability network is a whole other conversation topic for, topic for discussion. But that's how you defeat complacency. We could talk about training education all day long, taking academy classes, college classes, right? doing these Zoom online sessions. That's what defeats complacency. How do you keep it personally is a personal mission, vision, and values uh, statement. Hey John, while you're on that topic there, you know, organizationally as well, right? Same thing, right? The accountability network is the rank and file, right? The organization needs to have a vision and it needs to communicate that vision to the rank and file to carry out that mission, right? And I think a lot of times we miss that as far as, you know, cultures in the department as a whole is, you know, a lot of the time when people are, you know, morale is down, people are unhappy, it's because they just don't know where the organization is going. You're running calls and it stops there and it's, it's not a good habit. One thing, I wanted to, one thing I wanted to throw in there is a, a few years ago at a conference, I actually sat down next to a NIOSH investigator. These, this, is, this is a person that, you know, when there's a line of duty death, they, they go out to the fire department and, and they, you know, they do the investigations, they do the interviews and they stay there for a week or two and they develop their NIOSH report. And NIOSH reports have become somewhat boilerplate. You can, uh, again, I'm showing my age, a, a Mad Lib right? You can erase the department's name, date, and time, and, 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 and the incident, and you could put your own department name, date, and time, and we could all see a lot of similarities to what we're going through in our organization. So I'm, I'm having this conversation with the, with the NIOSH investigator, and I said, you know, so-and-so, what's the longest amount of time that you actually spent with an organization that you investigated? He said about 11 to 12 days. And I said, sir, with all due respect, you really think that you understood the culture of an organization within 12 days to understand what led up to those chain of events? The incident that happened on the day that it happened, that incident was driven by years of perspective, indoctrination, and culture. I said, do you really think that 12 days you can come up with a viable solution? Your, your hindsight is 2020. We can always say, yeah, the radio communication sucked. You know, there was a lack of incident command, lack of water supply, lack of building and knowledge, all the, all the different things that these NIOSH reports cite a lack of. 
How many times do you think that normalization of deviance has been cited in a line of duty death report? Every time. Three, three times. Three times, officially three times. But what do you think the normalization of deviance actually is? It's all of the contributing factors all put together, right? That's what the chain of events is. How do you break that? Well, there is no silver bullet or we don't have a wrench big enough to fix that. And again, it frustrates us because we're firefighters and we're fixers. We want to fix the problem, but it's an invisible problem, which deals directly with culture. And that's why I'm so passionate and so psyched that you asked me to come and speak about the normalization of demons because it's, it's, it's a brother to culture. So when you're, when you're looking at avoiding complacency, indoctrination is number one. When you're looking at avoiding the drift towards failure, developing positive behaviors, and only you know individually what your behaviors are. You know, don't be a, don't be a minute man. You know, get the pass on information, check your SCBA, make sure your, your, your gear is ready to go. All these different things that we know that we should be doing, but we don't. Why? Because we're under time and pressure to meet a set standard of performance. And whatever that performance may be, now, for, for the career firefighters, whenever your shift changes, let's just call it eight o'clock. Mine's eight o'clock in the morning. Do, do, you go, do you walk on the apparatus floor at 7.55 in the morning and drop your gear and then hope there's not a structure fire at 8.01 in the morning, right? You're behind the eight ball at that point in time. Think about that. What, what kind of a, of a behavior or a pattern have you set? And think about this. If you don't think that every action is being watched by everybody else, here's a, here's a little bit of a clue. The firehouse is like the 13th grade of high school, right? Everyone is going to talk about everyone, whether you think it's going to happen or not, which builds a culture all to its own, right? So think about the habits that you are developing. And, and in a live session, I use Legos. I use, I use uh, three by five index cards. I really can't wait for these travel restrictions and, and these COVID restrictions to go away because I would love to be in a big room with you all and get to these, uh, these group exercises. And uh, does anybody have any questions at this point in time? I know I've been rambling and talking about a bunch of different things, but they're all connected. No, I, I think you're doing awesome, John. I appreciate all those points. And, you know, one of the things you touched on that, that I'm a firm believer on is to say something, right? If you see something, say something. We always preach that to, to everybody coming in, that everybody's that safety officer, right? So, um, one of the notes that I took was, if it doesn't look or feel right, we need to say something, right? We need to be putting our perspectives out on the table so they can be heard. Because most often what's probably occurring is everybody is waiting for somebody else to stand up and say that same thing, right? So it, it only takes courage of one person to make that difference. So be that person with that courage. You know, there's no shame in, in saying that. And um, really we have, we have nobody but to blame or nobody to blame but ourselves if we don't. You know, the, the outcome of what happens, that's gonna rest on your shoulders at the end of it. So, you know, stand up, say something, and be that change that, uh, that we're all looking for and that we all need. There's two very complacent phrases that, that gets my blood boiling, and, and I'll leave it at this, this way we can have open up for questions in a round table. Well, that's the way we've always done it, right? That's one of the most complacent things or phrases that you can ever hang your hat on. That's the way we've always done it, right? The <laughs> just had a brain fart. That's the way we've always done it. And um, hmm, now I'm really having a brain fart. I want everybody to YouTube this on your own free time. It's called the five monkeys. This is an actual experiment, right? If you've yes. seen it, right? If you haven't seen it, it's great. YouTube, it's called the five monkeys experiment. And, uh, you know, when people ask, well, why do we do it this way? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Oh, the other one was, hey, the fire went out and no one got hurt. That was my second one. That was my second most complacent phrase. If your benchmark and your organization is, hey, the fire went out and no one got hurt, chances are you're in a drift towards failure because there's always something that can be approved upon, which is why you should have an after action review, a hot wash, whatever, critique, whatever you want to call it, right? I try to do an after action review in paper and it's just the facts, right? Because if you have a critique, then someone's throwing a chair, someone's flipping a table, and a lot of fingers are being pointed. But if you have an after action review, an actual document, and you review it and you go over it, it's a learning and teaching exercise. But think about that. The way we've always done it, and the fire went out and no one got hurt. 
If you're using those in your vocabulary, in your organization, I strongly encourage you to take a strong look into your drift towards failure. And I, I want to touch on what Duffy said too about the, the speaking up thing. I, I think it's kind of not humorous is a bad word. It's very sad that, you know, we're happy to speak up on the fire ground, on a traffic accident, on the EMS call. But we go back to the fire station where we spend 90% of our time and we all look the other way because, you know, nobody wants to be the narc. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody wants to be the person that found it. And, you know, I mean, I, I keep hearing it and keep hearing it through, you know, very, very smart people that came before me. But, you know, we put out the fires we put out are more in our fire stations these days than they are on the fire ground. So, you know, if, if you're going to change things, if you know, going back to the cultural aspect of this, if, if you don't want deviation to be normalized in your fire department, at some point, you're going to have to look somebody in the eye and say, stop. It stops here. No more. You know, no more of this. I don't care if it's the way we've done it, like John said, you know, I don't care if, you know, somebody's going to get mad if I speak up or the chief doesn't want to hear that. I, I don't care, you know, and, and that's this, uh, sadly, that's the scariest part for most of us is speaking up in the firehouse, which bleeds over to the fire ground later. Right. Mr. Morgan, you have a, a, a the statement of uh, an acceptance of mediocrity. And there's one phrase that I use is that the bare minimum is one step above inadequate. So think about that. The bare minimum is one step, one tiny step above inadequate. So, that all goes down to the ABCs, your attitudes, behaviors, and cultures. If you allow people to continuously just achieve the bare minimum, chances are they're going to drift towards failure. All right. So we, we've got 29 people in here, minus, you know, the four of, four of us knuckleheads that are running this circus. So surely somebody's got something to add, something to ask, something they want to discuss. I mean, I'm recognizing some names in here. There's a lot of smart names on this list, so. You know, Chief Alora is coming back. I'm just waiting for him because last time I was blown away with his knowledge. I'm kind of disappointed. He, he had like a fully involved building behind him. I was going to give him best background of the meeting, but uh, he seems to take it down. So we'll see what uh, Chief's got to add here. There it is. Yes. I use, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I was, I was on a, a civilian, if you will, uh, Zoom call with Michelle, my uh, – my partner there, and she was breaking my chops. Oh, well, what do you have to say, Chief? So I, I put this background up, and I said, this is the way I used to work, and point, pointing back at the building behind me. So this is all I need is my index finger. Anyway, um, John, I, I uh, first of all, appreciate you being here uh, and my ability to, to connect with you, even as, if it's virtually, because I miss you. I miss all of you uh, Jersey people a lot, more than I – expected and more than you know. Um, I saw your presentation. I, b I believe in the presentation before you, before you gave it, but I saw your presentation. Where were we? Which um, I believe it was uh, Expo, I believe. Was it the FRI, wherever the last one was? FRI Atlanta. Yes, that's where it was. Atlanta. That's, that's where it was. And one of the things that I, I heard, and you can please correct me if I misheard it, is that normaliza normalization of deviance is normal. It, it's, technically, it's technically unavoidable as an individual. Did I hear that right? 100% correct. Right. That's, the, that's part of the drift towards failure. It is, that's why it's normalized. Right. What you're trying to avoid is normalizing the actual deviance. And people who are deviant, they don't realize that they're deviant, just like they don't realize right. that they are in the, in the chain of complacency until something right. bad happens. So, so I heard that, and I said to myself, you know, one, one of the things that, that I do, and I think that, that we as individuals do, is, is strive for, for perfection, right? We want to be perfect which is one of the problems with people that do what we do is because perfection is, is inattainable. It, it's, it's impossible to be perfect, right? There, um, so, so one of the things when you, when you talk about, uh, I want to get back to indoctrination at one point, but I certainly don't want to uh, take over the, the, the chat here, uh, is, is to give yourself a break when you find yourself on that slide into deviance, right? Because, because we all do it, right? So, so the the best thing that you can be that you can do is strive for excellence, not for perfection, but be open to that feedback as well for others 
and constantly checking yourself while allowing others to, to check you as well, depending on where you are in your organization, that looks very, very different, right? I'm sure, John, that, that you um, see a difference in the way that you can impact people now that you moved up to chief versus as a company officer, you're still John, but your role within your organization changes, the way in which you engage with people changes, your responsibilities change. So uh, I, I, we, can, we can attain that or, or make an impact in that area at every level. Uh, as a matter of fact, Michelle was driving me home and she said, when you were talking before about the first year firefighter uh, acknowledging or saying something about the something's going wrong, she said, you can't do that. <laughs> and I said, not everywhere. You know, th there's, there's cultures out there where it's, you know, don't say anything. And, and it's, it's difficult because you want to empower those people to say something, but you, it's also very important to recognize that it's easier said than done. Right. So give yourself a break. Uh, because nobody's perfect, right? Str strive for excellence, not perfection. Um, you mentioned the term indoctrination. I, I was a little tardy in, in showing up, but um, what do you, what, that looks very, very different for different people, right? I mean, we've all seen the, the company. I, when I first got promoted to lieutenant, I got the worst company in the fire department. You know, it was like literally laughable. So although your organization has a culture, each individual company has a culture and you can be indoctrinated into a organization the correct way. And then you get into the company and it all goes to, to, to you know, to hell. Sure. So um, what, what can you, what can you as, as an individual, as a new individual, I see new people all day long now. One of the great things about being out of the fire service and getting back in in the in the in the manner in which I am now teaching um, at not teaching but working at a fire academy and, and teaching it in college is that I get to impact people that are new to the organization. So for me, if you really want to make a change in the fire service, make it with with the new people. Those are the easiest people to or the best people to start that change with. Um, what can what can be done to better indoctrinate people into a positive culture but all it all stems from the example that's being shown so in order to set the example you have to know what example it is that you actually want to set and actually right. have that discussion right so everybody has their perspective of what they feel is a is a is a positive example so this has to come from the the higher ups in the organization, because they're the, they are the people who set the expectations. We all have fire service expectations, social media expectations, family, all these different expectations that we have. But if the organization does not drive the set standard of performance, it'll be almost impossible to hold people accountable to a set culture. And it has to be exemplified. That's it's leadership exemplified. It, 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 the, the, bare, the bare necessities of leadership. This is what we are. This is how we are going to maintain this. This is what's going to happen if you don't maintain this. And by the way, here are the resources to help you get to the level that we need to get you to be. So it's the expectations. Now you can't set expectations without having the resources for people to achieve them. And you also can't set the expectations that are unattainable. Just like people, when they come in the door, when you're indoctrinating them, they already have their personal biases. They already have their prejudices. They already are pre-programmed into what their worldview is. And now we're trying to indoctrinate them into the fire service worldview, the organization worldview, and then the company worldview. There's a lot of conflicting views, if you will. So I appreciate the fact that you said that you had you know, the worst fire company in a department when you became the company officer. So the, the cards were stacked against you from the very beginning. The best thing that you could have done was just lead by your example, right? Well, because people are going to watch what you do. Yeah. Right. So that's essentially, that's what I'm trying to, was hoping to get in response, right? As, sure. as saying is, is hearing it, it affirms my belief in, in that um, what, what I never wanted 
as a new person, and once I started to move up the ladder, what I never wanted for the younger people was to feel like they didn't have the ability to make an impact. But with rank comes responsibility and not right. fire ground responsibility, right? The, the responsibility of your example. Um, so the word uh, indoctrination that you're using is, is the word acculturation that, that I've heard, which is you're not necessarily, I mean, it, when you went to the Marine Corps, yes, you were indoctrinated into the military, but you were acculturated into the Marine Corps, right? Which was very different than other branches of service. So, so for, for new people coming in, you get that conflict. There can be that conflict with an individual where they know that they're doing something wrong, but they feel like they need to do it in order to um, fit in, right? So it becomes the, the peer pressure, if you will. Right. Can I chime in there real quick, Chief? Yeah. So kind of what you guys are talking about, and I know we have a couple of chiefs in this, which is an awesome perspective because I recognize a lot of other names that are either current or aspiring company officers, right? And so when we talk about deviance, and, and Chief Laura brought up a good point about, you know, when you're a chief, right, and, you know, speaking up and stuff, I, I find a big struggle that I have as a company officer and, and many company officers I talk to is that you deviate because you don't go home like the chief does you know you're still one of the guys as a company officer you're still on the rig right so you got to have that hard conversation and then get on the line with that guy five minutes later right you got to share the bunk room with him you got to share dinner with him the administrative level positions they can have that hard conversation with you in office and they're going home right it's a lot easier and it's still family but it's different so you know at, at what point do you think a lot of company officers inadvertently normalize those deviances just because of, of that aspect of family and, and brotherhood and, and being together. Well, I, think about I'll, I'll push back. Tell me your first name again. Mark. Mark. I'll push back on that. And, and this is John Cho, but uh, the it, it, it's about not wanting to look bad, not wanting to look weak. It, it's, it's weak leadership is what it is. What's right is right, right? Doing the right thing is, is the right thing in the vast majority of cases. People know the difference between right and wrong. When I was hearing the, the, the conversation about seatbelts, for me, it was like once I got to a position where I was high enough up in my organization, it was please don't make me explain to your wife or your husband why you died on duty today, right? right? So, so don't, please don't put me in that, in that position. So you're 100% right that as a company officer, if that's your position, that you do have to live with that. Therein lies the, the essence of leadership, which is when you get promoted to company officer, people would say, to me, I would hear people say, well, I'm not going to change. I'm, I'm not going to forget where I came from. I'm going to do things the way I always did it, right? And I would say, if you're not changing, you're not doing it right. More importantly, because people are going to treat you differently because you're in that position now. So if you don't respond to that differently, I'm not saying to become a different person, but your people can feel very inclined to say, well, to themselves, or your inner voice, right? That's where it all starts, that inner voice, which is um, I don't want to say something about what somebody else did because I probably did the same thing with, uh, as a firefighter. That's never a good enough reason to die. That's never a good enough reason to get injured, right? So it really needs to become, at the end of the day, lowest common denominator about taking care of yourself and taking care of your people. Yeah, did I make mistakes? Yes. But I learned from them, right? Which right is right. We need to make sure we do this because. It was well, a very Mark, difficult a question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So I'm going to throw a word out at you. We're going to play a word association game. I'm going to throw a word out at you, and I want you to say the first thing that comes to your mind. All right. Ready? I think so. Discipline. Punishment. Why did you say punishment right off the bat? Because normally when you're called into a discipline meeting, you leave with punishment. What's the root word of discipline? Disciple. What's it mean to disciple somebody? Make them follow in your footsteps. Teach or educate, right? Teach yep. or educate. So again, it's all about perspective in the fire service. We think that discipline always has a negative connotation because the only time that you're getting disciplined is when you're getting called on the carpet, right? I so agree. with talking with Chief Alora said, and, and, and to your question, when you are trying to set the example, 
right? That is a positive discipline. So when you become the company officer or the chief officer, yes, your, your perspective has to change. Your responsibilities increase. You are still the same person. I'm still John, even though I'm a battalion chief now and not a captain. I'm still the same person in a training and safety position, right? But it's all about building relationships. This way, when I have to have that difficult conversation with somebody, they know that number one, it's coming from a, from a, a stance of sincerity that I actually care about that person, right? that it's sincere. You have to have a positive relationship. And if you have a positive relationship and you're trying to discipline somebody, whether it be positive and or negative, they are going to receive it a lot easier. It's a whole communication cycle, right? You have the message, the sender, the medium, the receiver, and then the feedback, right? The five cycles of communication. So building a positive professional relationship, you don't have to be best drinking buddies. You don't have to be fishing buddies, but I would like to say that I have a pretty decent relationship with, and I'm just going high here, let's say 75% of the people in my organization. Because there's some people in my organization that I will never reach. And that's where the personalities come into play. And, you know, but, but I would like to say that they at least will respect what I have to say if I had to disciple them, whether it be positive and or negative. So your responsibility changes, your perspective changes, but the way in which you speak with people with your relationships, that should never change. And always come at it from a form of sincerity that you, the end of the day, and, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't say this because I'm an advocate, at the end of the day, everyone goes home. And that's the goal. I have two rules when I was a company officer. Everybody goes home and don't end up on YouTube. Those are my two, st those are my two standing rules, right? So. You know you're going to end up on YouTube for doing this, right? So you're breaking your own rules. <laughs> yes, yes. And if you end up on YouTube, you got to look cool doing it. <laughs> That's right, Lee. <laughs> That's why Lee's got that mustache, so he can look good on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, we could talk for hours and hours on this. I mean, it's, it's all about emotional intelligence, you know, how, how you talk to people. You know, it, it, it all comes down to your upbringing. I mean, we could we could go really down deep in the in, in, in the weeds with this stuff, but as it pertains to the normalization of deviance, we are we are habitual creatures. So develop positive reinforcement attitudes, develop a strong accountability network, keep training and educating yourself because it's not your organization's responsibility to make sure that you are well trained. It is yours and yours alone. The organization can only provide the necessary resources and environment. That you can that you can grow and thrive in your in your profession and your vocation. Nice. I think that's a good way to start trying to wrap it up. If nobody else has any other questions, but you know that's I throw out all the time is just do what needs to be done. Right. It, it doesn't matter if you're the probie or the fire chief. It doesn't matter if it's picking up trash or washing a rig or you know chasing a kink in the hose. If everybody would just focus instead of trying to get everybody in trouble and point the finger. If you would just fix the problem, it becomes contagious, right? You know, people, they notice that. Well, I know I left this bad and somebody fix it. So, um, you know, stop normalizing deviance, as John talks about, and start normalizing accountability, and, and all of a sudden the problems go away. So, uh, anybody else got anything they want for uh, Brother John there? I, I appreciate it, man. Let's see if we got any more last-minute questions here in the field. Yeah, hey, John, I got a quick question for you. Shoot. Who's talking? Right, so I can't, I got like two screens. Who's talking? It's Dave Mellon. Hey, what's up, brother? Hey, not much, man. All right. So uh, one of the things that I was able to uh, incorporate into being a company officer with my department was the just cause culture. Are you familiar with that? Dr. Sidney Decker. Yes, sir. Yep. So, so that was like one of the big things that I kind of started implementing. Uh, and it was probably because I got in trouble a lot uh, <laughs> as a younger firefighter. So uh, I didn't like how the discipline went. But uh, basically, I just kind of wanted to pick your brain and see what you thought about that uh, kind of as the standard of discipline, because I feel like that was able to incorporate a lot of the things that you talked about in a formality uh, so that when people were getting brought in, they weren't necessarily feeling like they were always going to be in trouble. They felt like, hey, the department's going to look not only at me, but they're going to look at themselves as well. And by doing that, I feel like our department has become um, more ingrained in the culture as far as the discipline goes, because guys know when they get in trouble, we're going to sit down and look at every aspect of it. So, so when Dr. Decker talked about human error, um, he has two views, an old view and a new view. And his old view is that human error is not the explanation. 
The new view is that human error needs an explanation. Again, we are predetermined and pre-wired to always cast blame. So kudos to you for instituting a just culture because that is going in with crew resource management, positive indoctrination, and positive discipline because people don't want to speak up because they're, they're afraid of getting in trouble for speaking up, whether it be positive or negative. People don't want to share their passion or their view on a culture because it's different than just throwing a number out 10% of, of the organization that, that they belong to. So they're, they're chastised. So if you've ever read the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey, it's a great book, but he kind of ripped off St. Francis of Assisi a little bit. In, in his book, he talks about seek first to understand, then to be understood. So St. Francis of Assisi was the first, was the first one to actually uh, talk about that. And when you're talking about a just culture in an organization, you want to understand why things are happening, right? You want to understand, but most of the time, again, because we're looking to pass the buck or we get caught in that chain of failure or a chain of events, we're looking to say, you know what? Well, we don't have SOG, so I did it my way and it ended up not working out well. Or no one told me it had to be like this. Like, I, you never told me. Well, it all comes down to, again, per, uh, positive professional relationships and personal accountability and, and the, the bite off Jocko, if you don't know who Jocko is, look him up, but discipline equals freedom, right? And positive discipline and negative di discipline all have their roots in a just culture. And when something goes bad and you're instituting a just culture, it's because there's probably a lot of systemic failures, not just personal failures, also organizational systemic failures. Does that make sense? Awesome. Thanks for, yeah, no, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. John Haywick, you got anything to add, brother? I know you're on overtime, but surely there's something going on in that head of yours. Uh, John, I've listened and seen John speak, and we've had full-length car ride conversations many a time on uh, on this. And and again, uh, I'm gonna just go back to what I what I started out with. Uh, the junior officers, the lieutenants and captains, have that have that ability to make that change in the greatest amount of change for the fire service and the firefighters. The senior firefighter absolutely does as well for the ch to change the culture. Um, the John, I, I, had to, I had to bow out for a couple of minutes, but uh, talking about doing coaching and counseling is, is a huge aspect of changing that culture. Uh, pulling somebody in and going right to a, a written uh, reprimand is not the, is not the process of making change. It's the process of getting people in trouble. So the way I look at it is the fact of if something goes wrong, you got to coach and counsel first, put it on paper. So if they do it again, say, Hey, on this date, you did this. How come, how come we didn't change this? What was the, what was the, what was the issue? So in order to change that culture, uh, it's got to start, it's got to start at the bottom, but also at, at the top and have the backing of your, uh, your supervisors all the way up to the chief of the department. But again, Chief of the department might not know that information because what you don't know is you don't know. And sometimes you got to make it their idea to that they know it, if that makes sense. 100%. That's it for me, guys. I appreciate be, uh, having you on, John. And uh, it was uh, it's great to listen to uh, the great questions and explanations from everybody else. And the chat group is, is great tonight, uh, just reading things coming down, the, uh, coming down through the, uh, the thread. Delphi, what you got, bro? You know, I, I don't really have too much. I think you guys hit it all. Um, just about culture, you know, it, the thing is, this is a marathon, all right? This is going to take a long time. Um, like John was talking about, you know, we all want things now, and, and that's fine, but we have to think about sustainability, right? The things that we're fighting for need to be able to sustain themselves long after we're gone. Otherwise, they're not worth fighting for, you know. And we just have to learn how to pick and choose our battles and not just change things because we don't like them. We, we want to fight for that cultural shift and that cultural mindset because it's the right thing to do and it needs to be done, right? Um, if we're just changing things because we personally don't like them or whatever, then we're just constantly, you know, saying, hey, this is about me, not about the organization. And the end result is that hopefully we all leave it better than we found it. I, I truly believe that's why we, we are 
all here tonight. And that's why we all continue to take classes and learn and educate ourselves is that we could leave our footprint um, on our agency or in that fire service. So, you know, just choose where you battle between uh, ignorance and complacency and make sure that the things that you're fighting for are moving in a positive direction and aren't going to sidetrack you into this sidebar of more problems that you have to sift through just before you can refocus your attention onto what really matters. Good stuff, bro. So, all right. Uh, John Dixon, man, thank you, brother. As always, it's informative. It's good stuff. I can't get enough of it. I've, I've listened to you talk about this time and time again, and I get something new out of every time. So I appreciate you being here. John's put his uh, contact information bravely in the chat box there. So I hope you don't get too many spam calls out of that, man. Uh, I'm going to try to – sorry, I'm going to try to share a screen here real quick. So hopefully that's up. So um, just trying to give everybody some credit here. You know, um, this is, like I said, this is kind of a new venture for us. I, I think it's going well. I, I hope to have, you know, these conversations in the future. So, um, you know, Sean, thank you, brother. Always good stuff. I, I hate Pablo couldn't be here because I love Pablo's kind of like the, the quiet one that hits you with a stinger out of nowhere, right? He's just like sitting there <laughs> formulating something. And, and then you got the two loud mouths on the bottom there, myself and John, right? <laughs> you got too much to say. So, um, and then, you know, John, so as we said in the beginning, if you weren't here for the beginning, uh, Sean and Pablo do Build Your Culture. Um, John is with Beyond the Basics uh, training and also with the Thin Red Line uh, podcast. And then I do the Fire Inside. So if you like what you saw here, you want to check that stuff out, you know, we're always happy to have followers and, and stuff like that. And then uh, Brother John, at Instructor John Dixon on Facebook and InstructorJohnDixon.com. And uh, glad you're back on Facebook, by the way, brother. Good to see you back. So, yeah, I took a little bit of a hiatus, a little maintenance. That's right. Yeah, hey, Personal you maintenance. Have a up. That's right. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead. If nobody's got anything else, I'm going to stop the recording. And uh, we're going to keep the meeting up, though, because I know the recording kind of, you know, handcuffs people sometimes with uh, where they work and what's on their mind. So uh, we're going to turn the recording off. I'm going to go put my kids to bed and come back. And we're going to keep the roundtable going for as long as you guys uh, want to do it. So thank you for everybody that was here. And I hope you stick around for uh, the after party.